You volunteer at the mental health clinic. Given the dangerous nature of the residents, they assign you to the rooms of the less violent patients, the suicidal, those who hear voices, those that don't say anything at all. You become close to a mute man named Arthur. He's a great listener, willing to nod his head for hours as you tell him the story of your life. You mention your past and your present, the people involved in both and your hopes for the future, and Arthur just nods. After several months of listening, you figure that you owe it to Arthur to get him out of the clinic. He can't be happy sitting in a room by himself, nodding at interns every day. You talk to the supervisor of the clinic. You argue that he isn't harming anyone, that he grooms and feeds himself with no problems, that perhaps his condition is a physical ailment. The day comes when your arguing pays off. The supervisor has agreed to let Arthur go. You rush to his room and you tell him the news. You're free, you shout. Isn't that great? And Arthur just nods. You write your name and address on a piece of paper, hand it to him. I'm going to miss having someone to talk to, you say. But now you can write me. I can learn all about you like why they were so insistent in having you in here, pal. I had to fight Dr. Tanner every day to get you out. He looks at you and takes the paper and just nods. You go home feeling good about yourself. You brag to everyone you can tell, friends, family, classmates, co-workers, about how you came through for Arthur. You even fall asleep with a smile. That night, your eyes snap open. Screams, unearthly screams, wake you up. Then you see them. Your mother, your father, your friends, your classmates, your co-workers. Lying on your floor, their blood soaking into your carpet. Your wall stained with carnage. Their heads bashed in, their eyes missing from their sockets. Everyone you know dead or dying. You whimper and see a man standing in the doorway. It's Arthur holding the piece of paper you gave him. Your entire body shaking. You choke the words out. Are you here to kill me? And Arthur just nods. A few months ago, a friend of mine who was an up-and-coming nature photographer decided to spend a day and night alone in the woods outside of our town. She wanted to get photos of the woods and wildlife as naturally as she could for her portfolio. She wasn't afraid of being alone, as she had camped by herself many times before. She set up a tent in the middle of a small clearing and spent the day taking pictures. She filled up four rolls of film on that trip, but when she went and got them developed, she saw four pictures that unsettled her. These four pictures were taken from the inside of the tent, of her, asleep in the middle of the night. Outside of my city, there is an apple orchard, with a small cemetery at the end of it, with only about five or ten graves in it. If you visit the cemetery, it is customary to leave a small offering by the largest headstone. Even an apple from the orchard will do. If you do not, every night you go to sleep that week, you will see an old man in your dreams. On the first night, he will appear to be a normal, balding old man. He will tip his hat to you and walk away. On the second night, he will have a knife in his right hand. He will tip his hat to you and walk off once more. The third night he will lick the knife and laugh before disappearing. On the fourth night he will appear closer to you than ever before and lick that knife once more. On the fifth night he will practically be on top of you. On the sixth he will appear as a skeleton dressed in rotted rags, still holding the knife, still making the licking motion. No one knows how long this continues or how it ends, 
The victims have all either gone back by then and made an offering, or they have died of heart attacks in their sleep. Beneath the desert in New Mexico, there is a lost city in a dark cavern. Many have journeyed to the deep city, some have returned, some have not, completely vanished without a trace. As for what happened to the builders of the city, no one knows for sure. What I do know is that I've walked the rubble-strewn streets, and I've heard the cries in the dark, inhumane shrieks. I have no clue what these creatures that make these sounds are. I've been told that pictograms in the cavern suggest they were slaves to the builders. But, like I said, no one knows. Eventually, the random cries in the dark began to take a toll on me, and I fled the cavern, returned home, and until today told only a few close friends of what I'd seen and heard. Now, as I walk down the darkened streets of my hometown, I've begun to hear the creatures again. They are calling me back to the cavern. The time is coming. In France, a young ambient musician by the name of Charles undertook an interesting new project. He was going to record the sound of himself sleeping and release it under the name of La Nuit, which translates to the night. Charles lived alone in a rural area which would remove things like car alarms, traffic and such from being recorded. He planned his project for many months, acquiring the sensitive equipment to capture all outside noises, as well as his own during sleep. Finally, on the 27th of September, he decided to execute his plan. He set up all his equipment and fell asleep around midnight. The next day, Charles reviewed the recording. For the first hour, the recording played his own tossing and turnings as well as some distant dog barks and a few car alarms. These continued throughout the second hour as well, until Charles heard something that horrified him. For at exactly three hours and 24 minutes in, the recording played the sound of his bedroom door opening. <laughs> 